when the judge even tells you to stop screwing around and wasting time and money, you should probably listen. Let's head over to Ellis County District Court, Judge Glenn Braun. May it please the court, Dominique Davis appears in person and with counsel Heather Fletcher, both appearances by Zoom. May it please the court, Kayla Phillips appears by Zoom and by through attorney Greg Schwartz also by Zoom. All right, we are before the court for a status hearing to discuss the issues remaining uh, in this case uh, and the evidence. We've got a half a day trial set aside and that is for October 17th from 8.30 to noon. And as everybody knows, I'm not available anytime after that. Um, so we will have to finish the evidence uh, in that time frame. Um, I believe I've got a trial. Well, I've got recovery court. That's what it is. Yeah. Okay. So let's talk about the issues. Um, in looking at, just one thing I wanted to mention, I looked at the petitioner's response to the respondent's motion to modify child support and for sanctions. And Ms. Fletcher raises um, um, some legal arguments, um, in particular in paragraph eight of the response, um, points out that the language referenced by the respondent uh, is effective January 1, 2024, under the new child support guidelines, which differ than the old guidelines, and apparently has legal argument regarding the ability of the court maybe to uh, deliver the remedies requested by the respondent. Uh, do, I, do I read that correctly, Ms. Fletcher? Yes, Your Honor, in a nutshell, absolutely. It says, petitioner asserts that the updated guidelines do not impact existing child support orders, that child support, dot, dot, dot. Oh, so we've got a legal argument, at least one, there may be a couple <laughs> of others. So I'm going to want briefs on that before we go to trial. Uh, in advance, we'll talk about a briefing schedule. Ms. Schwartz, likewise, you'll want to file a response brief to anything that uh, Ms. Fletcher has raised in her response. Um, and uh, we'll talk about calendaring or and how we do that. Um, now, um, we also have the question of income. And I remember the petitioner testifying at the trial that he took the job in Georgia and his income actually was substantially reduced, um, but he has potential to earn more depending upon the commission available. And as I understand it, there may be an argument then about imputed income. Is that correct, Mr. Schwartz? Yes, Your Honor. Okay. So if you have any law that you wish to cite to the court, include that in this brief schedule that we're going to set out today. Now, those are a couple of things I picked up on. Um, so Mr. Schwartz, it's your motion. I'll let you go first and have Ms. Fletcher respond with any other issues. Um, uh yeah, one second, Your Honor. Uh, I just want to make sure I get a note down on what you just said there. Uh, the uh, I, I I think that's the, the correct. Um, uh, counsel and I discussed, and one of the things I was hopeful that we could get done, and I, I think we might be able to, and yeah. I've got almost all of it already done, but uh, all of the income, the work-related child care, the health insurance, uh, I think those are all pretty well identified, and I've got a spreadsheet I'm going to be sending to council with what I believe all those amounts are, and hopefully we can come up with just a stipulation as to those amounts uh, instead of having to go through and put on evidence of this tax return and W-2 and so on. Um, if we can, great, and that should, I mean, greatly limit whatever testimony is needed at that hearing. Um, I think the... Uh, a lot of this is legal arguments uh, as far as, uh, you know, the imputing wages and uh, sanctions, um, you know, either things happened or they didn't. And, uh, you know, so there, there will need to be some evidence put on, but I don't know that it's going to be significant. And maybe I'm looking at it wrong, but I think counsel uh, was in agreement for the most part during our conversation. So. Okay. Ms. Fletcher. Uh, yes, Your Honor. I, I think that Mr. Um, Schwartz and I had discussed that, um, I think, well, for instance, we both have the uh, the income should be straight, pre pretty well straightforward 
if if the court is going to go back and and do sanctions or whatever, I I think that Mr. Schwartz and I um, regarding like the incomes of the parties, I think we can probably come to an agreement on that. Um, and based upon the taxes and the and the uh, pay stubs, I think the insurance costs we've you know we can look at a lot of these things. What I look at on the worksheets, Your Honor. Um, that I thought were going to be issues that we needed to be making sure that we were either in agreement on or bringing before the court um, during the hearing was the um, the incomes, of course, the child care costs of the parties, the insurance costs for health care, the interstate pay differential, uh, the parenting time adjustment, the income taxes, and the multifamily uh, worksheet options. Those were the the issues that I saw that would be relative to the worksheets that we should be looking at. Um, and I don't know if Mr. Schwartz is in an agreement with all of those or not, but, and I can certainly um, have that discussion further with him. One of the things I wanted to address, Your Honor, was I, I get that we are going to do a briefing schedule, um, but I would also like if the court can set some kind of a deadline for us to exchange our exhibits in advance of this trial if we're not able to come to an agreement just so oh. that we can avoid so we can avoid what we had happening in august um i i don't want if, if mr schwartz has a spreadsheet that he wants to present regarding attorney's fees I, I just like that in advance. And, you know, both of us can exchange those same way with the sanctions that he's requesting and any proposed child support worksheets. If we're not able to come to agreements, I, I'd just like to have those in advance so that we don't have another issue um, needing to postpone this. I don't think Ms. Schwartz has any objection to setting a deadline for exchange of exhibits. And um, I think that would be beneficial to all parties and, uh, definitely be a cost savings. Um, so look, it looks like we've, you've set out, you think that what needs to be either agreed to or will be at issue is income, child care costs, insurance costs, parenting time adjustment, income taxes, and the multiple family adjustment. Um, now, there's no doubt that the petitioner has, um, I think, three children, uh, in his current marriage, correct? Correct, Your Honor. So, Ms. Schwartz, do you have argument that the multiple family adjustment does not apply? No. In all of our worksheets we previously submitted accounted for that. Okay. Um, very good. The multi-state, we don't object to either, Judge. Okay. Uh, oh, yeah. The... the uh, or, uh, or the parenting time, well, provided it was exercised. Okay, so those agreed to. Well, and and he put it with the caveat provided it was exercised. And the original worksheet, Your Honor, that went into play, I believe, is in 2020, had the parenting time adjustment on it. And then we had the COVID situation where, you know, that okay. affected some parenting time. Um, but our position it would be that it should be applied. It was originally set for 2020, and so it, it should be applicable in all of those years. So I don't know if we're going to be able to agree on, on that particular issue or not. Well, uh, I think what Mr. Schwartz, as I understand, uh, the parenting time adjustment is the court puts it in place, but if one of the parents getting the credit for parenting time doesn't exercise the parenting time, the other parent has the right to come back and ask that that child support order be modified accordingly, correct? Yes. Yeah. Yes, Your Honor. So um, now, uh, if we're talking about the child support worksheets for the years that they're asking for sanctions, then are you saying basically, well, Judge, because of COVID, we should still get the parenting time adjustment even if we didn't it didn't exercise parenting time? Well, it would come down to your honor again. I mean, no, I just, whether... I, I just, I, it just, it, I don't understand your argument. Is your argument that for the year that COVID intervened, that your client did not exercise parenting time because of COVID, 
And but he still is entitled to the adjustment. Is if that is that the argument? Yes, Your Honor, it would essentially be that um, because it wasn't by his choice not to have the parenting. It was something that was intervening that he could not control, right. which is something the court would certainly take into consideration. Um, well, except that the parenting time adjustment is to adjust the costs attributable to the care of the child. Um, so if you don't have the cost associated with the care of the child, even if it's an intervening factor like COVID, um, are you saying there's law that indicates, well, your parent doesn't get the cost, but because it's a, an issue beyond his control, he still gets the adjustment? Well, if I think that's that position, I, I think I need some law on it. Right. I, I think, Your Honor, and one of the, and I don't have it all in front of me, but one of the years, I believe that Mr. Davis had paid for some child care um, in advance, in anticipation of the child being there, and then the child ended up going back early. So I think that that was... I mean, he had that cost, but yet he, there was something that arose that the child wasn't there the entire time. So that may just be something that we'll have to present argument on know. or evidence regarding. I think, the, I think on that issue, we're not, we're not, we're not going to raise that. I mean, it, that, I think that was in 22. He had time that, that, that Zade actually came back early and whatever he paid, he paid. We've, we've, but, but I think, to the extent he gets a 50% reduction for the months that he has him half the time or greater in that year, he had him like in June and then he came back. He was supposed to be there in July, but didn't or have time in July, but that didn't happen. So, so I, I think he's only going to get one month of that 50% reduction versus two. And then in 2020, or that would be our argument. And then in 2020, we would argue that he doesn't get either of those months since he didn't exercise it. Okay. Well, uh, there can be, we don't have to spend a lot of time on the evidence. What what happened happened. If uh, the petitioner had costs associated with the care of Zaid, but uh, that he paid in advance and then didn't get back because uh, and Zaid uh, returned to his mother, then there might be. I think Mr. Torcher saying we understand that he may be entitled to some credit for that, but when he doesn't visit at all. Uh, we're going to argue that he doesn't get that adjustment because he's got none of the expenses associated with the parenting time adjustment. Correct. Okay. Well, that's that's easy enough. I mean, I think either... the, oh, I'm sorry, Your Honor, I didn't mean to cut you off. Oh, go ahead. Oh, I was just going to say, I think that the taxes, the income taxes, I believe that that's already been agreed to. Um, Ms. Oh, we're, we're okay. We're switching gears. I just want to make sure we <laughs> covered what was uh, on the parenting time adjustment. It appears that there's just uh, maybe some argument regarding past years where the petitioner didn't exercise the parenting time and whether he gets any credit. And we can have some evidence on that. Okay. Income taxes, you've indicated, you think they're in agreement on, there's agreement on it, Mr. Schwartz? Maybe, right? Yeah, they, they're they're going to alternate, Judge. Oh, wait. I think, right? Uh, or is she, are you claiming every year? Oh, I'm sorry. She claims every year. <laughs> yeah, I, that I was am. my understanding. Yeah. <laughs> And so uh, child support works, you would need to reflect that there needs to be an adjustment because of that, uh, because under the rules, they should be alternating. So every other year, uh, Mr. Davis, the petitioner would be entitled to that tax deduction he's not getting. Okay. All right. Are, is there an argument about child care costs? I don't think so, but uh, we we took whatever they provided and added it all together and divided it out for the year. That's going to be in one of the stipulation or what we're stip proposing to stipulate to and hers uh, for I think twenty or a few years. We have the actual receipts, but the others are on the tax returns, and so those are the numbers we're proposing. And I think once I get a the spreadsheet from Mr. Schwartz, then I can look at that, um, compare it to what I believe the cost was based upon the income tax and the receipts and things like that that we have. And then hopefully the two of us can agree, you know, to what those costs are. All right. So we have the, just again, I was going through my notes, Mr. Schwartz, the years that you are asserting you want an adjustment for and that you're also asking for sanctions for are what years? 
2020 through, and, and I, I believe your order for the new amount went into effect September 1st, so it'll be through August, or if it was August, then it'd be whatever the month preceding that would be. And there's a sanction argument there, but there's also uh, the month filing, the date we filed our motion on in, for whatever that time frame is too. So there's, I guess that, that window would be covered by two different arguments. All right. Okay. <clears throat> Anything else we need to talk about before we talk about a briefing schedule? No, there are a couple of clarifications that we would like to, or I would like to, uh, I sent over a proposed journal entry to council. She sent back and, and there are just some things I think maybe the court might weigh in on to clarify. From sure. The well, that's on the parenting time. Let's, right. I, and, I, we'll get to that. I, I'd be glad to discuss that with you, but let's talk about, oh, uh, is it my understanding that the, that this next hearing will be by, is it going to be in person or by Zoom? I know that this would require tremendous expense by the petitioner to come all the way back from Georgia. Yeah. I thought it was by Zoom, Your Honor. No, no objection to that? No. Good. All right. Uh, okay. All right. Anything else then? Okay, let's talk about the briefing schedule. We're set for October 17th. I'm going to need some time to digest the briefs and your suggest and what you can't agree on, uh, and you'll need to meet, com communicate in whatever form you can. What you can't agree to, you'll need to put in what your suggested findings of fact are, uh, and in conjunction with the uh, brief on the law. In other words, if if the two of you can't agree, then you'll need to and reference the exhibits uh, to support your particular uh, fact. And so you'll need to have an exchange of exhibits. So you'll know you could, if I'm just making something up, if, if Ms. Fletcher says, we believe that the evidence uh, will show, you know, uh, that the petitioner had, um, I don't know, so this amount of daycare that he paid in advance. And even though uh, his aide wasn't there. He wants a credit for it. And it would be this month and year. Please see exhibit. Um, she's the petitioner. So hers would be numbers. Exhibit five, page three, whatever it might be. It just so I'm not trying to wade through mountains. I, I saw I remember the books that were handed at the day of the trial. There was um, well, in fact, I think I'm still rehabilitating my shoulder from trying to lift them up. There was a lot of documents. So I'm going to need I don't want to be sifting through those. Um, so try to tailor your briefs so that I can page through and, and uh, look at that quickly. Um, so let's talk about knowing your schedules, knowing that we got October 17th as our date, and today's the 10th of September, so we got five weeks. How much time do you need to first figure out what you can agree upon and then figure out uh, what you want to brief. Uh, Ms. Schwartzer, the, the movement, so I'll defer to you to start. Um, well, I guess it, it depends how the, what the order is, but I've got a two-day trial coming up in a couple weeks here, so that's going to really negatively impact me. But, um, uh, I mean, as far as the exchange, the proposed stipulation stuff, I'm probably able to get that out today. And I've got the numbers that the other... The other piece I haven't gotten on there yet, and it won't take long, but I just need to put in the proposed uh, trigger dates that we would modify, you know, when ch children are born, basically, or moves. Good. End of year. So, roughly, when do you think you can have this exhibit? I think this is a, a what do you title it? Um, spread? It's going it, to be, it's going to be a proposed uh, stipulated amounts is what I've got titled, and then hopefully it turns into just stipulated amounts that we give to you. Okay. And you'll have that to Ms. Fletcher by when? Um, by tomorrow. Okay. Not earlier. Ms. Fletcher, how much time do you need then to respond to Mr. Schwartz regarding any disagreements you have? I would say if he gets it to me tomorrow, um, which is Wednesday. I could 11. probably get it back to him or get him a response by Friday. By the 13th. By the, by the end of business on Friday. Okay. Uh, and then Schwartz, you would, you'll need to figure out what, hopefully there's more agreement than disagreement. 
Um, I guess that would narrow down what your issues are then to some extent, what you're going to be presenting evidence on. So let's talk about a briefing schedule. So Schwartz, you'll prepare an order from today. So you'll have the amounts, I guess we'll call them, exhibit to Ms. Fletcher by the 11th. She'll have a response to you at the close of business on 13th. And from that point forward, um, here's what I might suggest. Um, we have a simultaneous exchange of briefs. We have a date for that. And then we'll have a date for any response that either side may wish to file. Uh, and again, I'll need law. You know, for instance, Ms. Fletcher, I pointed out on paragraph eight, you raise an issue that I have not uh, had raised before. And that is that that the new guidelines don't, well, may somehow impact what the relief is that Mr. Schwartz is seeking. Um, and uh, so anyway, whatever it is, um, we know that issue and then uh, the imputed income. If you've got any law you want to cite regarding that legal issue, um, you can include that. So how much time you need to do the brief? I'm going to want them. I'm going to want those to me by the 10th of October. So I'm pretty flexible. That gives me a week to do my own research based on what you submit. Mr. Schwartz, you said you had a trial coming up. So um, you said the 10th, you wanted those by? Yeah, October 10th. Mm -hmm. That's a week before the trial. I have a trial on the 8th, Your Honor. Oh. You got a trial on the 17th, too, so it... <laughs> yeah. I'm just trying to think of, you know, enough time to to write the brief and submit it, and then also enough time to have a reply without... Um, well, it's going to be simultaneous exchange. We know what the issues are. Right. So you're both going to submit them, and then your reply briefs... Probably the 27th and the 4th would be, um, I don't love those dates, but I don't know what else you're going to do. That'd be Friday the 27th and any replies by the 4th. Ms. Fletcher? Well, I was certainly liking that 10th that the, that the court put out much better. <laughs> well, I mean, I have to have everything briefed by the 10th. Ah, true. Um, well, and Mr. Schwartz, I don't, know that need, I don't know that you'll need a reply brief. I'm just saying. It, uh, well, uh, give yeah, I guess a, a week later wouldn't bother me at all. All right, so we'll do this. We'll do October fourth, and reply briefs, if any, by the tenth. Now, Ms. Fletcher, you got a trial coming in there, but um, you just have to come up with something. I, mean, I don't know that you'll even need them, but if you've got, and they don't have to repeat everything that you already filed. There's just be quick response to maybe a case or, or a guideline that was referenced, that kind of thing. Okay. So we'll, Ms. Schwartz, put those dates in. That gives you plenty of time as well as gives me time because I usually end up doing some of my own research. All right. Anything else that we need to cover on the issue of the Child support. Oh, and Mr. Schwartz, if you're going to be requesting attorney fees, I think we talked about this before, you can submit those amounts in camera with copy to uh, Ms. Fletcher. You don't have to file them in the court file. Uh, and um, as to what your request is in the way of sanctions, and that'll be an exhibit. And we needed to set an exhibit exchange date. We've got the one that you're going to submit, which is this week. But any other exhibits, do you want to put a deadline on when those need, which would include that attorney fee request? Plus, you're going to have to estimate additional attorney's fees related to this hearing and preparation. So any idea? Um, well, I would propose that, I mean, on the attorney fee issue, that we have a deadline and that we submit what we have till then. The problem with speculating is is you're never right and then it turns into an argument about being right or wrong and then if you're not right and it's more than you know so i i mean that would be my request and um and then any additional will get 
Because really at, at the point it becomes, if the court's inclined to assess attorney fees um, and if it's ordered, if there's any between those dates, we could have those submitted and have a follow-up hearing if need be on those amounts. But that, I, I just, it, it gets, but if we need to estimate, we will, but we'll probably estimate way high just so we cover ourselves. So. Well, the problem is that it becomes a, it, it just becomes a revolving door. Then we have another hearing. So you have preparation time for that hearing and gee, judge, I didn't estimate. Now we have another hearing. I mean, it, it, it's, I mean, if you're representing Bill Gates or, uh, somebody like that, I guess it's fine, but I don't think these people have the resources to continue to come back to court all over and over. So you come up with whatever you want to do. Um, and, um, if you want to just submit what you've got to date and then submit an additional one as a follow-up, if the court awards attorney's fees, fine. However you want to do it, it's your request for a sanction. All right, Ms. Fletcher, you ready? Your Honor, I my question was, I think Mr. Davis um, is also going to be submitting um, a request for his attorney's fees after the hearing that we had and, the, um, and in light of the sanctions that are requested by Mr. Schwartz, and you need to submit an, a request and brief uh, why you believe he's entitled to attorney's fees regarding the issue of parenting time uh, and custody, correct? Because I thought that we had, and I'm sorry, I'm just pulling up my pleading. I thought that we had put that in our response to Mr. Schwartz's, um, that the, in the response that we had filed, that Mr. Davis was also requesting his fees. But I don't have that in front of me right now, Your Honor. It just has in the wherefore paragraph, it said, wherefore, blah, 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 that petitioner be awarded attorney's fees. It Correct. doesn't say regarding what, but um, I guess there is a there is a prayer for it. Um, so if you want to submit your attorney fee request, uh, likewise, you can do that. Okay. We would point out, Judge, and I, uh, you know, those re responses are due seven days after the motion's filed, and that was filed months later. So you can brief that. Um, put that in your brief then as to what your opposition is to the request for attorney's fees, because that's a legal issue. Okay. Now, what is it about the parenting time that, or the journal entry that was submitted and what are the issues that I can muddy up before we get off the uh, Zoom? Uh, let me get over to that, Judge. I think I, I'm just going to take them in the order that they're in the journal entry. Um, so one was just the question of um, uh, whether or not there's language in that says further any anxiety of Zaid in relationship to the visitation with petitioner isn't because of problems with petitioner. Um, so I guess the question is whether that should be included or not. The, I, don't the, remember, I don't remember making any statement about that. I don't either, but uh, the, the previous part of that paragraph is that the respondent as residential parent has a duty to communicate with petitioner regarding Zaid and respondent needs to improve her communication with petitioner as it relates to Zaid. That part we agree with, but it's just that last sentence that I previously read that we had an issue with. And your honor, I had in my notes, um, and that's why I had responded to Mr. Schwartz to add that portion of the uh, of the paragraph. I can just pull it up here. Um, the court had, when the court was giving its its decision, the court um, did note that, looking at it, um, the anxiety, and, and I'm just paraphrasing, Your Honor, because I don't have it written exactly, but the court had mentioned something about it. The anxiety is because he knows mom doesn't like dad and he's going to see dad or has just been uh, with dad. Um, the anxiety isn't because of, of problems with dad. Um, that was that was what was um, relayed by the court. And that's why that's why we had just asked that that be included in there is that it the, these anxiety issues were not as 
because of something that that Mr. Davis was doing. Well, I didn't make a psychological diagnosis. If I made that statement, we're not going to put it in a uh, there was some testimony about anxiety um, and referenced it. But I'm not equipped professionally to make that. There was no professional testimony as to if he has anxiety and what the cause of anxiety was. And so we'll just um, leave that out. The I did mention that the respondent needed to do a better job of communication. Um, and I made that a specific finding. So uh, that'll stay in, but the anxiety language will come out. Okay. The Go next ahead. the next set deals with the flights and things like that. Um, one of which, um, and the council proposed some modifications and, and the one is whether it, the court had ordered that he fly as an unaccompanied minor. Um, the, the question is, was, did the court want him flying with a parent for the next year or not? Or, um, and then, I mean, he's going to have to fly, fly as an unaccompanied minor until the airline says he doesn't have to. And I, that's going to be, I don't know what age that is. I haven't had a chance to research it yet, but at a minimum or maximum, probably 18, but I don't know if there's some age before that, that they'll let a child fly alone. But I, I think they have to, um, I think up to a certain age, they have to have somebody with them at all times. And over a certain age, they, you know, they just have to be registered or something. But, but anyway, that, that's the question is what, for that first year, was there an order for parents or not? And, and my, my recollection on it, Your Honor, was that the court did say that he would fly as an unaccompanied minor and that for the if, first if, year. If available, I don't know what the airline rules are. I haven't right. been to those in some time, but if able, yes. And also that um, for the first year that it needed to be a direct flight direct. and that um, uh, the one parent would transport the child to the airport and to the gate, put him on the plane. Then the other parent would meet that plane at the gate pick the child up, transport him back. Um, so I did not have anywhere in my notes where the court was ordering that Mr. Davis accompany the child on the airplane. I said, if at all possible, they should he should fly unaccompanied as a minor, unless the parent chooses otherwise, but then they're not going to recover those costs. All right. And uh, that I wanted it to be a direct flight because the it's going to be traumatic enough for him the first time that I wanted it to be a direct flight. And there was a big argument about, or discussion, I should say, about, well, uh, for Ms. Phillips to do that from Ellis, she's going to have to drive to either Wichita or Kansas City or Denver uh, to make that direct flight. And it would be mileage associated with that. And that's part of the costs of travel that are going to be shared by the parents. Then you brought up that your client has to drive 45 minutes or something to the airport, whatever it is. I said, if there was mileage associated, not time, but mileage associated with that, then he would be given a credit back. It's just a matter of calculating the miles at the federal rate. So, uh, and you have to look at costs of flight, you know, in other words, these people I'm sure are pinch pennies like everybody else. So um, you're not going to pick the most, you're not going to pick Denver if it's the most expensive flight and that's the most, that's the most miles. That wouldn't make any sense. So it's, and they can exchange information. Did, did we, did we order them to use a, a parenting app of any kind? No. And, and judge, just according to my client, they've already communicated and, and kind of figured out how they're going to reimburse one another and, and started yeah. talking about this amongst themselves. So I think, I, I just want to be clear. We're not, they're not fighting as much as, and I don't know that Miss Fletcher and I are, it's just that we're just trying to get the language right on those that we don't have an agreement on. And since we had this, I, I think on the reimbursement, all that, there's no issues. The only other thing was, is, and Miss Fletcher referenced it again, that they take them to the gate and I don't think they can take them to the gate. I think they can take them to the, and what, I got this yesterday and I reviewed it today, but I think we probably need to go through and I'm going to try and find it, well, if, I don't know if it's going to be universal, but the language that the airlines use that says, here's where you're going to drop the kid off and use that. Because if you say the gate they were not, and they can't get through security, then they have to buy a ticket. All right. Um, I don't know what the airline rules are right now. And I know that they change. Okay. And so you deliver them to the airport and you comply with the airline rules. So if it's you leave them at security and they go through security with and you have to pay an extra fee to the airline to have somebody there to accompany them to the gate. That's the way it's going to work. OK, um, I, think, I think Mr. Davis indicated that 
because of the minor, the mm -hmm. child's age or what, that they can take them to the gate, at least in Atlanta. So maybe so. Well, Atlanta is the busiest airport in the world. I'm sure <laughs> they would rather have a parent take them to the gate, but I don't know. Uh, I think what you said there clarifies that. So if they do get to take them to the gate, they can. If not, they drop them wherever they're supposed to. So wherever the airline says. And and I think the next thing was, and and, and I don't know. This is uh, I don't even know if it'll ever come up, but uh, one it says they'll fly round trip, and we, while we don't disagree with that, uh, it's. Uh, I, I just want to be clear that it, is the court saying it has to be from the same airport? Because it might be such that the outgoing flight is, you know, well, there might be a couple of reasons. Maybe my clients going to Kansas City. The most, the most cost effective um, flights. I can see what you're getting at. And so, but here the other thing is that it, it's the most cost effective because both parents are going to share in these costs. So, uh, it can't be, and I, I don't think, Ms., I'm not trying to pick on Ms. Phillips, but she can't say, well, I think I'd want to spend this weekend in Kansas City. So he'll fly from Kansas City, and the next time I think I'd rather go to Denver because i got friends out there. You know, it's not. It's going to be the most cost-effective, and if it sounds like the parents are communicating, by all means, and, you know, just put it this way, you're spending more right now on attorney's fees than you are on a plane ticket. So if, if we keep arguing about everything, then, um, you know, the only one losing is, um, you two and your child. So um, it, I would highly encourage, and I think both of you, my impression was the two of you can put aside whatever issues may exist and cooperate to generate the most cost savings available. So that's what I would, I would just put in, that's got to be the most cost effective. And if you can't agree and it blows up, both of you can get, get your lawyers and we'll go to court. We'll do it by Zoom, and I'll make a decision. And I don't think it's that hard. I really don't. Uh, you know, you can say, hey, I can get a flight out of Wichita at this amount, and my drive to Wichita is going to cost this much under the federal guidelines. That's what you're going to use for mileage versus going to Kansas City, and this is what the costs are, and you send it back and forth by email or text, and you say, okay, I'll take the cheap one. Am I missing something? Well, I, I think part of it, Your Honor, um, and I know, I don't remember if the round trip language was in there. My my concern is when you when you purchase those tickets, you usually want to purchase them in advance. And my understanding, and I don't know all the rules and flight costs and stuff, but usually if you purchase a round trip ticket, it's cheaper than buying like a one way. Um, usually, but not always. Uh, right. I've actually I've actually flown and and. Uh, I flew to Florida here a while back and it was cheaper to buy. Uh, it was actually cheaper for me to fly in uh, to Tampa and fly back out of Fort Myers than it was to fly round trip to Fort Myers. It was, it, it, I saved myself about a hundred bucks. So, you know, in, in, you just never know. I, you know, and I, I know this, I'm not sure what Georgia is. So I think the parents just need to sit down on their computers and they can exchange information and come up with, because it's costing them both. So, and I think the only concern, I understand, I think the most cost effective solves that. So if it flights $300 to fly in and out of Wichita, but my client wants to fly out of Kansas City because it fits her plans better and it's $100 pays, more, pays, it's going to be her pays, cost. Yeah, she pays the difference. Yeah. But they're and, they're encouraged to work with each other to accommodate schedules. It's just that they don't have to eat the cost. Right. Whatever's okay. most cost effective. Okay. And uh, it's for Zaid. The, the next issues deal with the parenting time and or the summer, the first one summer. And I think what the court did, and I appreciate it, you, you got specific for the next two years. The problem I think that we have is we're trying to get an order that lives past that. So they just know that here's, here's what it is. And, and I think for the front end of it, at least my understanding was the court said it's the Saturday of the first full week. So if school lets out on Tuesday this year, whatever week it is, it won't be that first Saturday, it'll be the following Saturday. Um, and then it runs until July 31st and you set out dates for the next two years. But the question becomes is if the 31st falls, you know, it can fall on any one of the seven days of the week. And so our proposal was that if it's uh, Wednesday or later, it's that following Saturday. If it's Tuesday or earlier, it's the previous um, Saturday. Council's 
uh, proposal is that if it's um, Saturday or later, it falls on that Saturday. If it, well, yeah, basically if, if it's, if the 30th or the 31st is a Saturday, then it'll be that Saturday. Otherwise it's a whole nother week. And so I, I think we just need you to tell us which one it is because that you didn't really have a proposal. You told us to work it out and we're close, but we're two days, three days apart. And your honor, my position was, cause I, I know that this came up specifically during the hearing. Um, I, I think Mr. Schwartz had maybe asked, well, what happens if, if the 31st is on a Sunday and you said, well, if it's on a Sunday, then he's going to fly on the 30th, which we understood. Um, but if we if we go if we keep backing this up, then he's basically losing a half week of parenting time um, when the court said he's supposed to have the entire month of June and the entire month of July. So that's why we said, you know, if it if the 31st lands on Saturday, the, then he flies on the 31st. If it lands on Sunday, then he flies on the 30th. Um, that was our proposal. Because I think this next year he flies on August 2nd. So we've got the 20, 2025 and 2026 covered. But for sure, 2025, uh, 26, I think is still a little. All right, let's go to 2026. And what is the, the argument? 2026, July 31st is on a Friday. I think the, the question is, is whether no matter what year it is, because I, I mean, the, to do that, you'd have to go 27 until he's 18. And, and uh, hopefully so never come me back is the plan. Well, OK. So tell me where the first issue comes up. I got a perpetual calendar. here. I'm going through and I'm looking at it. I, I don't know, Judge. I didn't look. I was just I mean, if you go over seven years, it's going to come up on probably every day in that seven years. It'll be, it flows a day at uh, one year, it'll skip a day. But, and that was the question. Just, uh, I was just trying to come up with something that. Okay, let's go. Let's go in. Okay, so he flies out because school days, the end of school changes every year. It's never consistent. Um, and so the understanding is that he will go the first Saturday after the first. Okay, go ahead. Let's go through that again. It'll be the first Saturday of the first full week of summer. Okay. And we don't know what day school is going to end. Right. So, um, so if we go to 2026, just an example, let's say school ends on the 20th of May, which 2026, May 20th is a Wednesday. That would be their last day. So under your understanding of my ruling, he would fly out the 29th, which would be the first Full week Saturday after he gets out of school, correct? Correct. He he'd fly out on the thirtieth. Is that what? I'm sorry. On sorry, thirtieth. Yeah, thirtieth. Okay. Saturday the thirtieth. I right. said twenty nine. That's Friday. So he gets school the twentieth, and he would fly the first Saturday after the first full week after he gets out of school. Right. And then he's due to fly back on the thirty first. Correct. The the first August first, which that's August the Saturday. Uh -huh. Okay. All right. But which year are you looking at? 26. 27? 26. 26. Okay. Sorry. The, I just picking a date, the 20th. Maybe school gets out the 13th. I don't know. So if it got out the 13th, he would fly out on the 22nd or 23rd. If it got out the following week, he'd fly out on the 30th. Correct. And he flies back August 1st, no matter what. And I don't, I'm not going to pull up Ellis's 2026 calendar. I don't know if it exists yet. Maybe it does. Um, and so then in the future years, what's the, the argument is what is. I, I think it's just when that end date is. So our proposal was if, it, if the 31st falls on Friday or Wednesday, Thursday, Friday, or Saturday, he flies out that Saturday. So he, he's going to get extra in those years. If it happens to be on Sunday, Monday, or Tuesday, it would be the, pre, the preceding Saturday. Yeah. So let's take, because here's, here's where it's going to be like 2026. It's a Friday. Okay. Is the, right. 
the 31st. So he'd fly out on the first. Everybody agrees with that. Yeah, I don't think either of our plans change on that. Okay. The 27, it wouldn't change either because it's a Saturday. Correct. The 28, or 2028, it's on a Monday. So that would be the first problem year. So you're looking at 2028, the return date, correct? Yes. All right, let me go there and see if I, and I actually that's not going to be a problem because their proposal well no it would be I'm sorry because yeah theirs would be the their proposal it would be on the following Saturday ours is it would be the preceding Saturday mm -hmm. so the 29th is ours theirs would be August 5th okay all right and so Miss Fletcher your proposal is that and let me let me understand just so I'm clear because I'm looking at the 28th and I think that's the first time we run in now at that time, Zade will be how old? Um, four years. Three years, four years from now, it'll be twelve. Thirteen. 13. Twelve or thirteen. Yeah, I think yeah, thirteen. 13. Okay. So he will be in what grade? Should be seventh grade. Okay. Seventh. All right. Just trying to figure out. Um, okay. So, Ms. Fletcher, let's go to 2028. Ms. Okay. Schwartz says, I think that's the first year we're going to run into an issue. And your proposal is, since the 31st is on a Monday, he would fly out actually on August 5th, the following Saturday, correct? Correct, Your Honor. And Mr. Schwartz is saying he would fly out on the 29th, um, which would be the Saturday before. Correct? Correct. correct. All right. I will rule that he would fly out on the 5th, the following Saturday. It still would get plenty of time to get ready for school. If he, I know he's not big on sports. He may change his mind. I mean, we can't really lock in a nine-year-old to his opinions right now. But even that would get him back in plenty of time for any uh, start of any practices or ending associated with, I think fall sport would probably be football. Maybe they'll have soccer. I doubt it, but, um, but either way, I didn't think he liked soccer. If I remember correctly, but nonetheless, um, he can always change his mind. Um, so I'll give the dad as much time as possible. So if it's July 30th or 31st, it's that Saturday. If those fall on a Saturday, if not, it'll be the following. Correct. Okay. And then, uh, so that takes care of that one. Um, the spring break, um, I don't understand. I, there was, um, yeah, I'm not sure that there, there's a disagreement, but they say the same thing. So I don't think that needs to be brought to the court's attention. It's the Saturday till the following Saturday. So uh, um, winter break. Um, so this is, I. It's the same thing. The court kind of set out this year and next year, but the same thing as the summer. And uh, in even number of years you gave him from the day school, the Saturday after school lets out until the Saturday before school resumes. And then odd number of years you gave my client from the day school lets out until the 27th. And then he got the balance until the Saturday school resumed. And the question is, is what, I mean, are you intending that in, in his year, he gets the entirety of the break? that doesn't give her any time for Christmas. That was our under, our interpretation, Your Honor, was in the even years when he had Christmas, he was getting that entire break. Well, I think that's what I intended because he's, his visitation is going to be limited to the summer and spring break and Christmas holiday. Right. That's all he's going to get. So, yes, um, and mom can plan Christmas either when he returns or before he goes. Uh, she gets every other year Christmas, right? And um, yeah, and you know, when you when the dad's time, and I I know there's argument about he's the one that moved, and I understand all that, but his time is so limited during the year that generally that you know when we've got interstate or across half the globe or half the country, I mean uh, that's usually what I do, maximize the amount of time in blocks because it it's only three times a year. 
he gets, as I understand my order, it was summer, Christmas, spring break, correct? Is that everybody on the have every other Thanksgiving if it was if he was in uh Kansas or or correct. If he Colorado. comes to Kansas, he could have Thanksgiving every other year right. if he wanted to come here. But let's let's talk about practically speaking. That's you know, the real he's got three little kids at home. He I doubt he's gonna be traveling, but nonetheless, if if he did. The only reason we raised it, Judge, is because it is it's not it's not just parenting time, it's also Christmas break, so or Christmas, not just the winter break. So uh, but she'll have to figure something out when maybe when he's in school or something. So um the uh I think that's it. Well, oh the other thing the court allowed him to have 14 days or a time when he's in Kansas or Colorado with a 14 day notice. Um the concern there is 14 days is a rather short notice. And you know, if they have plans to do something, is it his time just trumps that at, on 14 days notice? Well, what would be enough notice? I, I don't know. I just hopefully more than that. Expect, but I just what is, what is, I, I mean, we got the parties right here. I I you know, well, gee, 17 days is what we need. Okay. If you I mean, I don't know. I'm picking a number. I thought 14 days, two weeks notice was sufficient, but if your client says, no, I need more time, what time does she need? Well, I don't, I'm just trying to look at things like if he's got a, a sleepover. I'm, looking for, I'm yeah. looking for, I'm looking for guidance. What, what, if 14 days isn't enough, what is enough time? We would ask for a 30, I guess, Judge. But... All right, Miss Miss Fletcher. I, I'm I mean <laughs> I think 30 days is pretty I mean that's an awful long time, Your Honor. I mean, if he were to a month. Uh, I don't know. I, I don't know, Mr. I don't know what Mr. Davis's normal travel schedules. I don't know what he anticipates in the future. Will he be, is 30 days like, oh no, I I won't. I mean, he's talking about traveling from Georgia to Kansas. And so, uh, I mean, the, I, I don't want to run parent schedules. Uh, I want them to tell me, you know, what they need. Um, in the way of notice that is reasonable um i think that 30 days is is honestly too long your honor and and mr davis I, agrees with that um we were fine with the 14 days um i i think that that's plenty of notice i mean it, <laughs> i'm going to keep it then with my original ruling. be 14 days okay and, and look i'm going to emphasize this again you can keep coming back to court and it'll be a different judge ruling, but you can keep coming back to court. And and we all know what the result of that is. Large attorney's fees, increased emotions, and stress on your son. That's your choice, okay? Uh, we have parents that love to fight. They come to court regularly, uh, and their attorneys don't get along because their clients don't get along. And so we just repeat the pattern. That's, you know, I get paid the same no matter what. Uh, I think the long-term damage to the child is extreme and I will leave it at that. Okay. Because kids pick up on it. So I'll just leave with my original ruling. Anyway, if it's a sleepover, dad takes priority over a friend now. Uh, but I know, I know what you're talking about. Is it, you know, and, and here's the thing, if it's something really important, uh, a big science fair that he's involved in and all that. And dad says, Hey, I happen to be coming that weekend. Dad can take him. You know, mom says, okay, you take him to it. You know, something like, I don't know. They got to work. And, and if you come in front of another judge and it's just constant conflict, then I can assure you, uh, not only will your kid be all messed up, but you're probably going to incur the wrath of a judge down the road. So, but we'll just leave it at 14 days. Anything else? Yeah, I'm sorry, Judge. That's the last we have. I didn't want to bring these up, but since I'm the one that has to do the journal entry, I got to get answers to these or we'll be back at a separate hearing. So that's all yeah, we have. Okay. 
Well, if we have to come back again on this journal entry, then both somebody get their checkbook out because there will be an assessment of attorney's fees. Okay. This stuff needs to be worked out. So, okay. Anything else? Ms. Schwartz? No. Ms. Fletcher? No, Your Honor. All right. Ms. Schwartz, if you'll prepare journal entry from today's hearing and please don't have a disagreement about it. I, mean, I assume that journal entry from today's hearing is only going to cover the calendaring. I mean, the, 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 the status uh, conference, not the status conference issues. Correct. Okay. Any other journal entry just needs to be filed after, now that we've got clarification. I guess I should have followed what Judge Booker told me. That is, just be specific as you can be and let everybody complain about it. And he said, parents will work it out afterwards. They'll cover your own mistakes. I I, um, I, I never really adopt, but I, I guess I should have learned. Um, so uh, anyway, anything else? No. No, Your Honor. Okay. We will be adjourned. Thank you. Thank you.